around 10 centimeters long, the human kidneys are located beneath the diaphragm and behind the peritoneum. The kidneys are able to filter the entire water content of the blood every 45 minutes, which is approximately 151 liters. Of this amount, only one liter is excreted. The remainder is actually reabsorbed back into the blood. In our last lesson, we looked at transport in humans, where we examined the role of the different components of blood, the structure of the heart, and the blood vessels. In this lesson, we want to look at excretion in plants and animals. Please remember to like, subscribe and post your questions in the comments box below. These are the specification points we'll be covering. In today's lesson, we want to be able to understand the origin of carbon dioxide and oxygen, be able to understand how the kidneys carried out its roles in excretion and osmoregulation, be able to describe the structure of the urinary system, be able to describe the structure of the nephron, be able to apply the words ultrafiltration and selective reabsorption, and be able to describe the role of ADH. As a starter, what are the components of blood? Describe how white blood cells protect us. Explain how the heart rate changes during exercise. You can pause the video while you think. Question one, the blood is a tissue composed of red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma, and platelets. For question two, there are two types of white blood cells, the phagocytes and lymphocytes. Phagocytes work by being attracted to the pathogen due to chemicals they secrete. The pathogen is then able to bind to receptors on the phagocyte. The pathogen is engulfed by the phagocyte, producing a phagosome. Lysosomes release digestive enzymes onto the phagosome, digesting the pathogen. The phagocytes are then free to repeat the process. Let's now take a look at how lymphocytes work. Lymphocytes detect markers on the pathogen called antigens. Even our normal cells contain antigens, but it's those markers that the lymphocytes detect as being foreign that prompt them to release Y-shaped proteins called antibodies. These antibodies have a complementary shape to the antigens which they stick to. Once the antibodies bind to the pathogens, three things can happen. The bacteria will burst open and die. It labels the pathogen so that it can be recognized more easily by phagocytes. It sticks pathogens together in clumps so that they can be easily engulfed by phagocytes. Antibodies can also neutralize toxins produced by the pathogen. During exercise, there's an increase in the oxygen demand, especially in your muscles that need the oxygen to carry out aerobic respiration, to have the energy to contract. To supply your muscles with this oxygen, your heart must beat faster. An increase in heart rate also allows for waste products to be removed. The medulla in the brain area controls the heart rate. When we exercise, we produce more carbon dioxide from aerobic respiration. Receptors in the aorta and the carotid artery, which is the artery leading to the head, detect the carbon dioxide levels. This sends electrical impulses via sensory neurons to the medulla. The medulla responds by sending impulses along nerves which stimulate the heart to beat faster. When carbon dioxide levels return to normal, nerves from the medulla cause the heart rate to drop. Metabolism is all the chemical reactions that occur inside of a living organism. Two important metabolic reactions include photosynthesis and respiration. These reactions produce waste products that need to be removed from an organism. Excretion is the removal of metabolic waste. In plants, there are two main excretory products. These are oxygen from photosynthesis and carbon dioxide from respiration. So how is oxygen and carbon dioxide lost in the plant? Plants don't have excretory organs like humans. So both gases are lost from the plant by diffusion out of the leaf via the stomata. In animals, there are three main excretory organs. These are the lungs, the kidneys, and the skin. They secrete salt, water, carbon dioxide, and urea. Your body is not very good at storing nitrogen-based compounds. So when we have excess protein, this can't be stored in the body like carbohydrates can, which are made from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. To remove this excess protein, a process known as deamination occurs. These are the steps that occur within deamination. First, amino acids are converted into ammonia, and then the ammonia is converted into urea, ready to be expelled from the body. The urinary system is responsible for removing waste products from our body. It is made up of the kidneys, the ureter, and the urethra, which connects to the bladder. 
The kidneys play an important role in excretion and osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is the control of water levels and mineral ions in the blood. If you look at this diagram here, we can see the kidney's internal structure. There are two essential areas of the kidney. The renal cortex, which is the outer part of the kidney. The inner part, which is the medulla, which consists of multiple tissue masses called the renal pyramids. These are triangular structures that contain a network of nephrons. Nephrons are the functional unit that make up a kidney. Each kidney contains over 1 million nephrons. They play an essential role in the reabsorption of water, glucose, and ions. The nephrons have five important regions, the Bowman's capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. <laughs> Blood enters the glomerulus at high pressure. The glomerulus are a network of capillaries found in the kidneys. Due to the high pressure, blood forces out glucose, water, urea, and salts into the Bowman's capsule. This forms filtrate. The Bowman's capsule membrane filters or enters preventing larger molecules like red blood cells and large proteins from crossing the membrane. This process is known as ultrafiltration. The filtrate will then move towards the proximal convoluted tubule. Here, a process known as selective reabsorption occurs. Glucose is selectively reabsorbed by active transport. The nephron has lots and lots of mitochondria, which provides energy for active transport. Selective reabsorption can only occur in this region of the nephron as protein gates facilitating the active transport of glucose are only found in the proximal convoluted tubule. Water moves out of the collecting ducts via osmosis. The permeability of the walls of the collecting duct can be altered depending on the need to reabsorb more or less water. Receptors in the hypothalamus are able to detect changes in water concentration in your blood. If water levels are low in the blood, they send signals to the pituitary gland to secrete a hormone called ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone. ADH travels in the blood towards the collecting duct where they make its walls more permeable to water, thus resulting in more water being reabsorbed into the blood. You end up with little and very concentrated urine. When water concentration is high in your blood, less water is reabsorbed. This makes you produce urine in greater volume, which is more dilute. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand the origin of carbon dioxide and oxygen, be able to understand how the kidneys carries out its roles in excretion and osmoregulation, be able to describe the structure of the urinary system, be able to describe the structure of the nephron, be able to apply the words ultrafiltration and selective reabsorption, and be able to describe the role of ADH. In our next lesson, we'll look at the structure of the nervous and the hormonal system. Please remember to like, subscribe, and post your questions in the comments box below.